फाइव भाषा इज डन फाइव भाषा मंत्र फाइव भाषा इज नॉट डन फोर इज फोर इज डन ओके ओम सहना सहनौ भुनक्त सह वीर करवाह तेजस्वीतमस्तुमाषा वह ओ शांतिशांतिशांतिविंग फॉर्वर्ड विथ अ स्टोरी अवर स्टोरी वेर Najiketa was not having a very good day. <laughs> Why? Because the father, father's anger, he was exposed to, and uh, he was so innocent. That shows how small he was. Is that he first didn't think that oh, somebody is mad at me. What did I do wrong? Nothing. He didn't feel that. he instead went to the place he didn't internalize it he didn't uh, get angry back at the father he first thought maybe yama need something from me <laughs> and then he thought no that's ridiculous what will yama need and then he came back to thinking father must be angry and then he thought that you know we have to father has said these words out of anger but out of respect for the father so that the words are not falsified mind you this is not some kind of a protecting the patriarch kind of a endeavor that's a different thing you know where in families you know all the like for example in kind in situations of domestic abuse it's all everybody is hush hush about it and nobody speaks about it because it's all about protecting the patriarch and the patriarchy so the children learn not to talk about it and the you know the whole family pretends as though everything is all right this is not that here he is not trying to protect the father and uh, uh, make sure that his father's image in the society is always that of the truth teller and the truth bearer no his concern is only one what is that that a big ritual is going on and what is the father's desire to gain heaven and in between the ritual if you tell lies what's going to happen you are going to go to the other place <laughs> and not just in between the ritual any time you know you are you are not you know what's that you are just sort of helping yourself to untruths you know second third helpings to for untruths then you are certainly not going to gain um, desirable ends why because truth you know truth keeps you in sync with who you are you know that satyam that's why it's called satyam satya bhashanam is directly connected to satya satyam gyanam anantam because the two it's your nature satya bhashanam the speaking of the truth is in keeping with that uh, one and only existence that's why both have the same name sat that sat it's connected to sat because everything resolves in that it is without another it is it is itself there is no place for duality and same thing in satya bhashanam there is no place for internal duality that's the problem because that's why the two have the same name because satya bhashanam keeps you in in uh, in line with that oneness which you are you know hoping to discover as the truth of yourself through the knowledge through the study and so this is this is part of the part of the you know growth of the human being as prescribed in the first portion of the veda where satyam vada dharmanchara swadhyaya anma pramadah speak the truth always follow dharma and keep close to the teachings that tell you to speak the truth and follow dharma and you know that's what the whole thing is and therefore what and that's the there is a certain growth because the first portion of the veda if it is taken properly as a means it is not useless 
it makes the person grow and first the person groans and then the person <laughs> grows yeah first oh i can't do this oh no and then the person grows grows enough emotionally cognitively to be able to understand the truth of the self and to understand the truth of the self one has to be in alignment with one self through the practice of speaking the truth and and then what then we have to um see that nachiketas conjecture that okay the father must have been angry but yet his first uh, his first thought speech must not be falsified is uh, and and his uh, his desire to not falsify the father's um words are not I- I- this desire is not springing out of trying to protect the image of the father some kind of a false image in society oh my father always speaks the truth no he is only interested in not messing up the chances for the father to gain what he really wants he is trying to aid the father in bringing out the dharma that is the whole idea you know why should the father be a liar because he got angry and said something he didn't mean to say because you know everybody can get angry and it's okay and in fact you know we have a mantra in uh, when the child is initiated into the veda kamo karshihi kamo karshi manyu rakarshihi kama karta na hankarta kama karaita na hankarita manyu karta na hankarta manyu karaita na hankarita it's very interesting because here both desire and anger are invoked as the cause of going away from dharma the child learns to do that after the age of 8 it's amazing it's a fantastic prayer and this is daily repeated yearly repeated you know kamah akarshihi you know akarshit what is that kamo karshit kamah akarshit akarshit means what is was the doer so whenever i go away from the right way of being in alignment with the cosmic flow whenever i'm out of that flow then instead of blaming myself what do i say i came under the spell of the anger i came under the spell of desire desire is the doer i am not the doer and then there are two ways of doing you can either do one something directly or you can tell someone else to do like the mafia don you know when he sees someone uh, that needs to attain immediate moksha he just looks at the henchman and looks at that person that's all just one sign enough <laughs> and then you know so who is going to get the bad karma the henchman or him both actually but but, but he is not going to be the, the the don is not going to be spared he may be spared by the law because there is nothing connected you know his hands appear to be clean you know there is no blood on his hands but why he is just uh, you know he is an uh, you know artist in the art of subterfuge that is all it is he has hidden behind all these people and so the hit man that is why it is called hit man all he does is hit you know uh, people out of existence and so this is called first is if you do something directly which is out of flow it is called karta the, the when you do and then when you cause things to be done by by lurking in the background in the shadows you cause shady things to be done you yourself are never to be found in the shadows you 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 claim non accountability you you pull the strings so that something happens but really speaking then that you know you are culpable and when you pull the strings and cause something to happen cause the balance in the universe to be disrupted you are not karta you are karagita karayitri kartri two different things same thing it's connected to the doing but kartri directly an actor karayitri 
indirectly an actor because the actor happens to have some other sidekicks who <laughs> the person can assign the dirty work and look really clean. Correct? And so in this prayer, Kama Karta, who is the Karta, who is the doer? Kamaha, the desire, the force of the desire. How can desire may do anything? No, the force of the desire. The desire came with such force that it blindsided me and I was no longer available to stop it. So therefore, desire is the karta. Na hang karta. I am not the doer. And then what? Kama karaita. The desire made me do something more specific. You know, and then same thing the, the child repeats with uh, anger. Manyu uh, akarshit. Manyu rakarshit, manyu karta, nahan karta, manyu hukaraita. Manyu means anger. Yeah. Anger. And uh, anger made me do this, meaning under the spell of anger. Yeah. This is not some way of escaping. These prayers are not some way of escaping responsibility. But it is. Seeing the force of anger and desire in one's life and respecting that and, and also praying from a sense of healthy non-self-blame, taking responsibility without blame. Usually what happens, one is quick to blame oneself. I am wrong, I, I shouldn't have known better. Well, I didn't because the force of the, the, the desire, the force of the anger was so much that I was out of my senses. And here is Nachiketa's compassion. He recognizes that the father, because of his busyness and all his other pressures, came under the spell of anger and uttered something that he did not mean to. So therefore, let us make it true. Not because we are trying to protect the father, but so that Already, you know, one tells so many lies in the course of one li one's lifetime. You st stop uh, counting how many, you cannot count. Because they just, uh, you know, even though the person may not be a good speaker, you know, suddenly the speech waxes eloquent when it, uh, when it surrounds untruth, really. And then one untruth builds upon another untruth, you know. Oh, I was in D.C. yesterday and I had breakfast with Obama. Well, somebody else will already have seen you having breakfast at the local cafe and you were <laughs> somewhere in India, you went to DC all right, but you know, maybe you had breakfast in the White House neighborhood in one cafe, that's about it, that's as close as you got to Obama. But then you just come back and tell everybody that you had breakfast with Obama. And then what, somebody who has seen you, then you have to tell them another story. Oh, it was not this time, it was earlier. When? You know, then you make something up. And then somebody else knows at that time you were doing something else. And uh, you know, oh, it was two years back. I just got confused. And then if it was two years back, somebody knows that two years ago you were out of the country. So then it's just you have to keep uh, shielding lies with more lies. So in the whole of course of the lifetime, in fact, it's no longer lifetime, it's lie time. The whole lifetime you can take out the F. You know? <laughs> it's just a series of lie, lies from birth to death. And so the idea is here, let's not increase the burden of lies that one is already carrying. Because here it was unintentional. You know, the lie. The lie was out of what? Anger, fear, desire, whatever it is. It was a help. It was, the intention was not there to deceive. If the intention is there, there is no protection accorded, afforded. But since the intention of the father was, it was unintentional. Which father will tell the child, unless of course he is extremely abusive, go out to death, you know. Generally speaking, we don't find that. And so obviously the anger came because not because he hadn't taken an anger management course. Even if you do take an anger management course, anger does come. And when it comes, it blindsides you to do either hurt others or yourself, sometimes both. And so therefore, that is what is being talked about here. And because it is unintentional, that is, see, on, on, the, on the father's side, so that is one criterion, 
why you know people like Nachiketa step in to rescue this particular lie and make it a truth and this is in fact the, these kinds of uh, stories have an abiding presence in the in the shastra in the body of the teachings because in fact the whole vedic tradition is all about promises it's all about promises and in fact even today on our one rupee note or ten rupee notes it's a it's called a promissory note the bearer of this note that's why we don't call it bill we call it note it's a promissory note we don't say one rupee bill nobody says that a ten rupee note and what is this note where did the word note strike a note here the note is from i it because on the words of that currency indian currency it is written i promise to pay the bearer the sum of so many rupees in what in a little microscopic amount of gold that's what it is the gold standard <laughs> of course nobody cashes in because it has become cash that has what is 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 that is what is called the promissory note in fact the whole tradition is all about promise and the motto of india is satyameva jayate from the mundaka upanishad truth alone conquers truth alone is victorious truth alone stands nothing else stands and this has come from the tradition itself where vak tapas the speaking what you mean and doing what you said you would do thinking what you are about to say the alignment of thought speech and action which is called riju bhava arjavam in in the in the 13th described as arjavam in the 13th chapter of the bhagavad gita is highly acclaimed as a universal human pursuit the truth is the pursuit that's why dharma becomes the first pursuit and therefore you know these promises hold a lot of water see because of the promise we have one promise we have ramayana what is that promise with this uh, dasharatha promised his stupid wife the two boons because <laughs> you know maybe she was not stupid she was very crafty rather you know he promised his wife two boons because she had she showed amazing skill in rescuing him from a war with the baddies called asuras and the axle of the wheel of the chariot broke and she was driving the chariot amazing and so when the axle breaks down that means the war is gone you nothing should happen to the rider rider nothing should happen to the chariot so these are the rules of engagement of the ancient wars and that's why karna was in a fix when the chariot got stuck in the mud literally and then you know so here he would have lost the war because the axle broke but what did she do she put her finger into the hub of the wheel and held the axle with one hand while with the other hand held the whip and managed the horses and drove literally him to victory and so he said i'm so pleased with you and i want to give you two boons and then what the rest is history she said i'll take a rain check i don't need anything she was in a good mood she says i don't need anything right now <laughs> i'm so happy you won the war that we won this war i don't need anything when i want i'll ask you know and then when uh, rama who she regarded as her own son but really he was the son of the elder queen and so therefore the eldest being in the line of succession he was to be anointed as the heir apparent apparently not <laughs> because that is the day on the day that he is going to be crowned as the heir apparent you know she has an heir raising thought and what is that <laughs> she says my son should be the heir and then rama is very popular and all oh, the whole of ayodhya where he lives is wonderful they just love him and she knows as long as he is just sitting there eating bananas while his they will never allow his son to rule bharata will get rotten tomatoes <laughs> and bharata will not rule as long as rama is there because bharata was very attached and worshipful of rama so then she thought oh the second boon is there let us become craftier still and let us believe in the out of sight out of mind let us send him to the forest 14 years 
is a long time and who knows if he'll come back because forests are not like here, very tame now, you know. The most dangerous things you can en encounter in the woods are birds and squirrels. That's all, nothing more. <laughs> so not like that. Before there was all these things, you know, boars, wild boars, because they bore into the, the skin, that's why. You know, they have these huge uh, tusks. They are very wild. They are just, they are not, uh, you know, they are not uh, tameable, manageable. And then bisons and uh, all other things, elk, these are just among the vegetarian animals, but then there were other non-vegetarian things lurking around. Hyenas, lions, tigers. Yeah, who, who said, why bother cooking and eating vegetables? In fact, vegetarians taste better. So let us go straight for the kill, literally. <laughs> so, the, so this is, and no one who was banished to the forest ever came back. Hardly. And so she said, let's send him off. Because instead of giving him a death sentence, let's send him off. Kareita. Let's let me just, you know, I'm not going to be directly responsible for killing him. I don't want to be messy, you know, and like Lady Macbeth, you know, and have my hands full of blood. No. I'm just going to dispatch him and let the eagles and all these things take care of the rest. Yeah. There will not be anything left of him. Let him go. And then these two bright ideas she presented to Dasharatha on the day of the coronation. And then, you know, all that, Dash and then she had, uh, had a little tantrum. She went into the anger management room, yeah, which every palace had. It was made of some transparent substance glass, I suppose. Because there you could have a tantrum in safety and nobody bothered you, but they made sure that you were not, you know, hanging yourself or otherwise becoming suicidal. So uh, all the palace uh, servants were watching as she went into the anger management room. I mean, Dasharatha literally left her looking at saris and wondering what she would wear and she, she asked him to pick out what she would wear. She was so excited. And two minutes later, you know, Miss Bipolar went into the anger <laughs> management room and then had a fit and she was, you know, in tatters. She had torn her clothes off the body. She had undone her hair, which is not a very nice thing to do. And then, you know, she was crying, weeping, screaming, jumping up and down. And then, you know, having a huge, full-blown, you know, mental attack. And uh, then, you know, Dasharatha was informed. He came hurried. He scurried to the scene and said, what happened? And then she said, I want my Bharata to be seated on the throne and I want your Rama to be dispatched to the forest. And Dasharatha, you know, at that time could have said, I want those two boons, these are my conditions. You know, the boons were given in private, there was no witness and Dasharatha in the monarchy, being a king, is the supreme court of justice, he is the law of the land. He is the executive, he is the judiciary, he is the legislator, he is everything. He could have simply said, shut up. <laughs> what booze? I don't remember any booze. Get dressed and be in the hall in 15 minutes or else. That's all he had to do. And she would have had no other recourse if he had not honored the verbal promissory note that he gave her several years back. But that thought which comes so easily now, you know, was in Kali Yoga, was not even an option for Dasharatha. It was not an option. He never even went there, even mentally. He fell at her feet. He said, let your son, you know, be the ruler. No problem, but don't send my Rama to the forest. I will not be able to live, live when he departs. My life is in him. And it, he proved it by dying promptly as soon as Rama left. He died of a heart attack, broken heart. But he fell at her feet, he begged, he cajoled, he tried to reason, but he never went to the place of falsifying his own words. This is, this is the, what the person grows into, the one who is interested in this knowledge. And this is what the Upanishad is demonstrating. And that's why, you know, Rama intervened and he wanted to make his father's words come true. That's why he went. He said, no, even, you know, if you take this back, 
He told the mother, the, the, the stepmother, even if you take this back, I will go because for his sake, for the sake of his veracity, you know, because he did this, you know, with the best of intentions he gave you this boon and he has to keep it up and I am the object of this boon, my going away, so therefore I have to go away. So because of one promise you have this whole epic surrounding one promise. And then Mahabharata is another promise. <laughs> Bhishma's promise, I will never marry. That set in, uh, into uh, you know, motion a whole lot of all kinds of activities and uh, you know, accounts. This one story, that one story, because he didn't marry, you know, then all these other people were born and then these other people gave birth to other people and then these things happened, you know, that was one promise at the start of the Mahabharata. Bhishma, whose name was Satyavrata, again, interesting, you know, the one who keeps uh, Devavrata, yeah, same thing, the, the, the one who, who keeps his word, the one who is, you know, committed. To, to being godly, godlike, that is the one. And so he basically kept his word and he made such a fierce promise that he was henceforth known as Bhishma. And then in the middle you have another promise, another way in which the words are, you know, become the highlight of the story. Arjuna, you know, goes to win the hand of Draupadi. Draupadi is having a ball to choose her consort. This was there in the olden times. She secretly was in love with Arjuna. Usually when they had this kind of a marriage, that's why I told you yesterday, Kanyadanam is one of the many kinds of marriage. This is called Swayambara. You yourself invite all the princes and you know, and then you, you know, go with a garland and your attendant and uh, you know, who, whose job and then the king comes with his, all the kings and the princes come with their own attendants because it doesn't look nice to you know blow your own horn <laughs> and so you have the attendant telling this is Raja Dirhaja Maharaja of this area and he has planted so many trees and he has dug so many wells you know this is what they did ecological things that they did. Things haven't changed that much. And so still we have to continue planting trees. <laughs> he built roads for the people. These are public works that usually are there. And plus he can compose a poem. And if you let him, he has composed a poem for this occasion, you know. And she is not impressed. She walks off with a garland. And then, you know, the king sits down, you know. And then the next king stands up. So like this, they were all in a circle and she would go and choose one of them. And sometimes they would have some, you know, um, contest, whoever wins this contest. And in this case, it was the latter, that she had made the contest so difficult that only Arjuna could uh, do this. And Kunti did not want him to go and win her hand, you know. She had her own reasons because it was all about political alliance and everything like that and she did not like Draupadi's father very much, you know. And <laughs> so she did not want Arjuna to go, you know. But Arjuna unbeknownst to her secretly went, won her hand, brought her back and Kunti is doing puja. And when you, when you are worshipping, you are not supposed to be distracted and do things, you know. And he comes to the door and he says, Mother, Look at what I have in my hand today. Look at what I have brought. And she keeps quiet. She doesn't say anything. She's trying to meditate. And then he says again, just like Nachiketa, see? <laughs> Mom, look what I brought. Look. And you know, in, in, to, in the minds of most mothers, the child is always five and a half. Yeah. Whether they are 45 and a half, 55 and a half, 65 and a half, doesn't matter. The child is always, you know, five and a half. And so, you know, <laughs> the child never grows up. I don't know why it is. But you know, most mothers are like this. And so, she, being protective and, you know, talking like as though he was five and a half. She says, because she is sitting inside, he is just at the door because she has to go and welcome the new daughter-in-law. The daughter-in-law just cannot enter. There are rules. 
uh, because otherwise you can say why was the daughter in law and the son were lurking outside the door they were not lurking they were following the rituals because any time the new bride is brought she is seen as a as an embodiment of goddess lakshmi may she bring in a lot of abundance so she is honored like a goddess and brought in for the first time when she enters the marital home so there are rules surrounding this she can't just enter and you know you, you know uh, excuse me i have to use the bathroom this is <laughs> this is not done you know excuse me where is your kitchen i'm hungry you know you, you know you, this is not done so she they were waiting to be welcomed ceremonially and uh, then you know she just thought he just thought she's talking to five year old arjuna and she said you know she said you know my son you know my policy for anything that is brought into the house all of you share it equally oops <laughs> you know and then she heard a wail it was draupadi <laughs> <laughs> then she said oh something is not right she <laughs> whose voice is this she ran out to investigate and to her shock it was the bride it was her daughter in law and then we don't know who who is great we don't know you know if the sons are great that they agreed to make the mother's words come true because she had uttered them again unintentionally not with malice and we don't know if draupadi perhaps is the greatest that she agreed to this and we don't know if the mother was great because unintentionally she said something that was going to change the course of history <laughs> you know but what the what they did they followed a protocol because they had not come to a situation like this but they didn't say oh she just said it because she couldn't see them she was sitting on this side no they had a sabha an assembly of elders in which kunti and draupadi were present and they asked draupadi first of all are you willing to honor these words and after she said yes you know what a high price to pay to be married into this family <laughs> she hasn't even seen the face of the mother in law and she has to honor these words i mean think about this think about her greatness she said yes because she didn't know she uttered it without saying and then they sat down and formulated a contract that one or two years she is going to spend with each husband and with each fellow and at that time the other people are not going to contact no sms no emails <laughs> no i miss you honey no such <laughs> things no messengers you have to leave them alone this was the terms of engagement of this this uh, this uh, case of polyandry in you know this is something which is interesting but here this vak tapas reigns so much in the imagination even today it's like once you do say you are going to do something you will give up your life but you have to do it you cannot it, the worst thing for a hindu is to say i'm going to do this and then somehow not end up doing it that's the worst thing and look at the west such a contrast i changed my mind <laughs> well i didn't really mean it i'm going to give you a million dollars well you know what i i i just uh, i don't know i must have been out of my mind and i'm not going to do this and you know this is what the whole thing is and therefore this here since the father's words were unintentional nachiketa scrambles to not let them be falsified and that is what this is this mantra is all about बहुना मे मि प्रथम बहुना मे मि मध्यम किद्यम से कर्तव्य किद्यम से कर्तव्य यन्मयाद्य क्यों सो he says and there is a, a you know there is a setu bhashya a, a kind of a bhashya that links the two verses together let us look at that first sah sah ev muktaf putra ev muktaf putra ekante ekante paridevayan chakar paridevayan chakar katham ityuchyate katham ityuchyate <laughs> this is the bridging bhashya between the two mantras very interesting because otherwise you don't know where this thing has come from so adi shankara bridging the two mantras 
says that after the father dismissed him so unceremoniously, he went to his room. E kamte. E kamte means alone. Alone means where he must have gone to his room. <laughs> father sent him packing to his room. <laughs> So this was the ancient way of saying, go to your room, and so which he did, and <laughs> which had the same effect. So he went to his room, and undisturbed he introspected on his paridevayan chakara, means he lamented at the turn of events. This yajna which was going on so nicely, it was unfolding so beautifully. What happened? Alas, it's not having a very good end. You know, maybe I got out of the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> But I am not having a very good day. But then, so this is what is called Paridevana. Paridevana is going over and over the same thing with the, with the hope and the view to, um, to be able to get some insights. You replay the conversation in your head to get some insight. So, div, not uh, divyati, that not, the, not in the sense of kridayam, not in the sense of play, but div in the sense of Lament, div in the sense of thinking, there is another div, there are many divs. So this is uh, another kind of a div. And so here, paridevana. And uh, uh, so paridevana here means, pari means all around. And uh, looking all around for some clue in the sentences spoken or f for some idea what is meant by this. So he basically went into a kind of a slightly sorrowful introspection. This is what Paridevayan Chakara were in his room. And then uh, Katham, how did this Paridevana look like? Iti Uchyate, Iti Aha. So therefore, how did, if one were to ask, what did this introspection look like? And what did he say to himself? This is what he said to himself. This is a solo conversation. This is a soliloquy. And uh, what is this soliloquy like Hamlet? And what does Hamlet say? To be or not to be, that is the question, you know. This fellow did not ask that. Did, did, for him that was not the question. He had a different question. Kim Amasya Kartavyam, that was his question. <laughs> what can possibly Yama want from me? <laughs> I am so small, surely it's not my time to go to Yama. What can he possibly want of me? And what does Yama do? It's a very boring clerical, clerical, mostly clerical job of counting jivas and putting them on the various beltways to next lives, uh, assembly line. You know, Yama has you know, assembly line job, simply. Because all that is already ordained by Bhagavan, he just carries it out. And what does he do? Oh, you, cluck, cluck, he puts it on the chicken assembly line. Yeah, he puts it on the chicken assembly line. Yeah, cluck, 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 cock a doodle doo. And the, <laughs> and the other one is what? Creep, creep. And, and there is one assembly line just reserved for creepy incarnations. So he puts it to creep along in the next life. Yeah. That in also includes creeper, you know, because it's <laughs> there is a different way of categorizing all this. So, Yama is in charge of a huge factory with many beltways and the jivas are just coming and sometimes they come in hordes, as you know, one earthquake and there's two hundred thousands of them, so you have to quickly put them on various beltways. And he has all these servants, he has, and they have shift work and, uh, you know, and all of them are working graveyard shift. And then, you know, and then he has to put them on various beltways and make sure. It's a clearing house, warehouse of jivas. Where, W-H-E-R-E, -E, house. Where are they indeed? That is the big question. So, he has to quickly look at, they all come tagged with the karmic uh, things. Ka what, what have they done, you know? <laughs> Have they been extremely creepy in their life? Yes. All right. This is a no-brainer. Put them on the creepy belt. Yeah. Well, this one is a little bit iffy, you know. This one has done some good things. But, uh, but you know, still not quite this thing. You know, very mixed. A little bit good, a little bit bad, you know. Completely mixed up. Okay, human life. You know, this is what it is. <laughs> Ooh, this one has done mostly wonderful thing. Celestial belt. Yeah. 
some kind of celestial blessing capacity you know be a small devata invisible to others you, you know yeah because the papa a little bit of papa was there what was the little bit of papa nobody notices me i'm always <laughs> invisible so yama has a sense of humor he has a certain latitude he has he has a little sense of humor he can just dispatch with a little sense of humor this is the clearing house so then nachiketa knows this and nachiketa wonders in this clear being huge clearing house of jeevas what what is my job am i gift wrapping them and sending them <laughs> gift wrap means the particular body that is the wrap for the jeeva you know there is some uh, dish called the wrap what is that called it's uh, yeah wrap what is what does it have inside some chapati it's beans. just a chapati okay it's just glorified name it's chapati with some vegetables and beans and then you roll it up like a blanket you know and it's called a wrap so the the jeevas also have a wrap a wrapper what is the wrapper alligator skin yeah <laughs> meaning alligator life so they are wrapped in alligator skin and the jeeva mistakenly thinks oh i am so nicely wrapped and then it realizes this is not such a good life after all <laughs> even when i cry nobody believes me because i'm a crocodile <laughs> so <laughs> even when i'm sad they don't believe what a life huh so nachiketa says so am i going to wrap the jeevas putting before putting them on the beltway or am i going to make the jeevas you know put the, as usual or am i going to have an overseer job or i'm going to count what am i going to do kims with yamasya kartavyam what possibly yama can have for me to do kartavyam that which is to be done what is there that which is to be done done by me in this clearing house of lord yama yanmaya yatu maya karishyati that he is going to have me do because he thinks he is going to go in a certain kind of a servitude mode because he's been given away and so all his uh, tan man dhan body mind <laughs> everything has to be you know dedicated to this yama and what will this yama do he's just wondering and then in this wondering he is also doing a little self appraisal <laughs> yeah and this is what the self appraisal so we looked at the last nine kim swit swit means there is a it's an expression aho swit aho swit means just or that's all yeah it's a big word for or isn't there another word va i will only use that okay use that <laughs> yeah aho swit you know and this swit is a kind of a indeclinable particle that's all it is and so kim kim swit kasya swit you know kasya swit dhanam in the up, uh, what is that in the ishavasya upanishad ma gridha kasya swit swit is just for emphasis so so kim swit what indeed what in fact as yamasya kartavyam yama has to do you know yama has to be done what is there to be done for yama yat that maya through me karishyati he is going to get performed so last line we have seen and now he his self appraisal to where he falls in his own you know in his own uh, idea usually in one's own uh, self appraisal one falls badly i'm not good enough oh even vedanta i cannot study of course <laughs> why even vedanta <laughs> because i have tried everything else and nothing i can do even vedanta i cannot study you know because usually that's how people come to vedanta nothing else works let's try this when all else fails you know read the upanishads this is <laughs> this is usually people's uh, what is that people's relationship to vedanta nothing else has worked so i'm going to give this a try finally you know so in the last analysis and even if this does not work oh my god i'm i'll have to go back to the drawing board crying board and uh, you know so therefore what so here his self appraisal is something to follow is an example to follow for everyone who who has the good fortune to understand what he is saying really if you find yourself in this classroom it's a very good thing because it shows you how to do this self appraisal he doesn't say i'm a loser i'm a born loser born ascha asau loser ascha you know that <laughs> yeah he doesn't say that i i'm you know i'm no good 
nobody loves me i have abandoned father also got angry see everybody just when i just walk around i'm a ticking bomb i bring out the worst in others he doesn't say any of these things he says what bahu naam among many e me eshyami gachami you know i i among many i am e me means i am here prathamaha if you compare if i compare myself to others perhaps of the same age peers then i am definitely the first because you know in intelligence perhaps in strength in the ability to you know uh, in the grasping medha shakti in the grasping power and in recall you know dharana shakti that is because <laughs> medha shakti is only one part she is a you know she is a goddess that has another sister twin sister medha means as soon as you are told something the mind catches you know and the medha shakti can be as bright as the ray of the sun wonderful oh i understand immediately what was said and i can you know i can appreciate the connections and medha shakti also has to do with connecting things together both visible and invisible and so like visible connections you know like oh this was said and yesterday something else was said so between the two there must be a relationship and so let me let me make that bridge with my own intelligence let me conjure up the relationship think up the relationship that is in keeping with what was said not just make up something yeah so that is what is medha shakti the grasping power and the power of you know completing sentences interpolations you know like you you know where the argument is going and or if you don't know you are anticipating it even if you don't know and you are able to enjoy the thread of the thinking and you are able to see where it goes and appreciate that this is medha shakti and this you know everybody has to a greater or lesser degree and then what you know in the classroom it's very obvious because people are nodding people are smiling people are enjoying you know and online i'm just going to hope that the same thing <laughs> is happening <laughs> otherwise people would not keep coming so so online also i'm presuming the same thing is happening but what happens after the class is over somebody asks what was taught ah uh, something wonderful <laughs> that's what you become very general why because medha has a twin sister called dharana shakti so the medha shakti is part a you know like medicare it comes in two parts <laughs> part a and part b <laughs> so what is part a medha shakti the ability to grasp and then what dharana shakti the ability to retain what was grasped and why should this retention be necessary because then it is you know if there is a part c it would be called recall shakti smarana shakti recall shakti that that ability to recall it at the right time but what can possibly when will i want to recall the upanishad what for will i want to recall the upanishad you know so many things it says so many upanishad i mean right now we are studying mundaka upanishad <laughs> katha upanishad shweta ashvatara upanishad and katha upanishad again and so you know <laughs> we are studying a lot a lot of things and gita which is like an upanishad <laughs> studying a lot of things and so what is the use of recalling all this when why would i want to recall this you will want to recall this when you are feeling low mm-hmm. ah that is when to recall this like even this bahu naam e mi prathamah so when one is feeling when one's feelings are not in keeping with the vision of the upanishads that is when to recall that is when you have to understand and you quickly get out of this uh, you know well of sadness that one has in, in inadvertently fallen into and so we we get uh, uh, one self one get one self out of climbs out of the well using the rope ladder of the upanishadic words yes that becomes a rescue otherwise one is always in samsara you know i need a rope like <laughs> throw me a rope and then somebody throws you a rope what do you say eek snake <laughs> <laughs> 
You don't even trust that. Rescue. <laughs> so that is the time to recall this, the classes. That is the time even if you don't know Sanskrit, the classes are in English. So you recall certain words that have touched you, certain things. So dharana shakti is very important. So bahuna meni prathamaha means among many people, I come first in terms of medha shakti, in terms of dharana shakti. And there is one more thing because the medha and the dharana are useless unless they translate into action. Yeah. What is the use of knowing a lot of things? You know, and the person is unavailable for transaction, but knows a lot. Great scholar, great pandit. What's the use? You know, doesn't do anything, doesn't even teach. And then what is the use? You know, you keep locked up all these things. You hoard the knowledge and what is the use? And so that is not the idea that this Medha Shakti and Dharana Shakti translates into everyday activities because he's a small boy, he's going to Gurukula, he's doing all these things and everything. So, and uh, so, you know, the everyday activity should be informed by one's intellection and one's capacity for retention and recall because otherwise one, you know, is keeping on walking into doors and walls. This is what it is. So this is how to lead the life in a bright way, you know. And Medha Shakti, even though it relies on inten uh, intelligence, it is, we define it more as a grasping power. That's why, you know, it's that we cannot always blame the IQ. Oh, I don't have good IQ. I mean, unless one is not capable of stringing two sentences together or making the logic. You know, sometimes people are not able to. There is some developmental disabilities. So barring that, we are not talking of any kind of developmental disabilities or, you know, some kind of a, uh, that which impacts the brain. We are not talking of that. We are also not talking of personality disorders because sometimes people with personality disorders have a lot of medha shakti, but they are unable to translate into action because there is some disorder that is coming in the way of using that Medha Shakti properly, you know. So we are not talking of those two ends of the continuum. We are talking of where normally people fall. Because Vedanta means you have to, you know, not have developmental disabilities or personality disorders. Because then the, the, the you know, it will not bless you in the way that it otherwise could. So. Provided that you are able to follow the line of reasoning, this is just a basic requirement, you know. And how do I know if I am able to do that? If you have, if you are able to go to school and follow, even in kindergarten, what the teacher says, <laughs> the connection between A, B, C, D, that is Medha Shakti. So that's why we don't define it as intelligence. We define it as the power to grasp and the power to see the connections. And, and uh, therefore, in not defining it as an IQ-based thing, it is not set in stone. Medha grows if you allow it to grow. The more you, the more the ragadveshas do not crowd the mind, the more the Medha Shakti, there is space for it to cultivate it. You know, and this teaching itself makes the recall quicker. Yeah, and makes the retention longer. This is what it is. Very beautiful. So the Medha Shakti grows and along with it grows my tolerance for keeping the knowledge. <laughs> you know, I don't let it all, you know, leak out. So there is a certain kind of a retention. So he is perhaps looking at himself from those two standpoints. And then there is one more standpoint because it is the ability to, in a teaching situation, we are only talking of the teaching situation here. So he says, Bahunam Emi means what? Um, among many, I am the first. Among many who? You know, children. But what kind? What is their role? Putranam Shishyanam Va. You know, means either children of parents or students as a student. Among many students, I rank the first. Bahuna Emi Madhyamaha. And among many others, I may come second because he he's very objective. He's not being <laughs> egotistic. He's not saying I'm the best, East or West. 
you know and he said among many if i look at myself in terms of abilities medha shakti dharana shakti all these things in terms of my you know strength and intellectual capacities i rank first among many and among some others i may rank second there may be people who are more qualified than myself and then he stops there he says kadachit na adhamaha never do i rank last yeah and here prathamaha madhyamaha should not be even though for sake of translation we say first and second and what is missing is third it's not numbered 1 2 3 it has a different meaning for we we cannot we don't have words to uh, you know translate this particular uh, you know this particular continuum of prathama madhyama and adhama because adhama is not third yeah prathama means you know of course uh, first but here it means uttama bahunamemi uh, uttama he is actually wanting to say uttama means exalted madhyama means you know okay let's take the last one adhama means really bad low lowly adhama adha means below beneath so the one who is not able to even get up from the ground lowly and uh, and then that which is neither lowly nor exalted average is madhyama i mean these are like i said not proper translations but they will do so he says so what is he really saying even though he says he, the translation will say among many i rank the first what he is saying is among many i will be i will come out as exalted and then among many others i may be average but at no time kadachidapi na u adhamaha i'm never adhama means lowly so what is this this little continuum here it is used in the tradition for ranking one's self or seeing where one is it's not a judgment uh, by the teacher or by others to make about other people but it is a helpful list for to see where one ranks and to correct that rank if necessary to see where one ranks as a student so there are certain ideal typical uh, what is that criteria that are established which very helpfully anandagiri in his tika gives us you know to this particular mantra tika means a, a certain uh, bhashya for a bhashya a, a, a small uh, um, note for the commentary as like he is not commenting on the text he is commenting on the commentary and so he just inserts it's the, the point is not to bring down the commentary of adi shankara he respects adi shankara a lot he just fills in a little more information where which was perhaps you know as obvious um, as the five elements in adi shankara's time here it's a little less obvious perhaps so he's bringing it out he's bringing out the gems of the bhashya and so he gives us a very helpful um, you know what goes in each criterion uh, of what is that prathama and then madhyama and then adhama so prathama he says among students this is how to rank yourself no teacher will say oh you are an adhama that is not the point <laughs> get lost you are an adhama no and no student should say that to another student ah you are adhama this is not helpful correct so you know of course no one can help it if one has thinking that in privately but certainly it's not be it's not something to be bandied about this is a helpful list of criteria for to to see where one falls and anandagiri in his tika says something very interesting he says prathama or uttama is the one who is signaled or who sets himself herself apart by the divra shushrusha what is shushrusha as it got anything to do with shoes because shoe comes ha shrotum ichha the desire to hear because this is all about keeping the ears cleaned out literally and figuratively so that the knowledge enters and sits 
it's karna parampara it's a ear to mouth you know yeah mouth to ear and then ear to mouth ear to mouth if the when the shishya becomes a teacher mouth to ear and the teacher is teaching the student so it's a karna parampara mouth to ear 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 to mouth resuscitation from samsara <laughs> It's not a mouth-to-mouth resuscitation because sometimes you have to blow the, you know, air into the, the, the person who has stopped breathing. The heart has suddenly, you know, seized cardiac arrest or something. So you have to press and then blow some oxygen, you know, and, and, and restart the lungs. And uh, so, so this is, you know, this is what is called CPR. And uh, the CPR from samsara, you know, how to get rescued. When one is numbed and dead, deadened in samsara, you need ear to mouth, mouth to ear, resuscitation. <laughs> yes, there are the words of the Mahavakya, the, the teaching that dispels sorrow is whispered into the ears of this deadened, saddened, jaded, faded jiva. Ah, that is how the resuscitation takes place. Oh! I have woken up to the truth of myself. No longer am I struggling. No longer am I having trouble breathing. I am all right. I have a new lease of life. In fact, it is indeed a new lease on life. Very beautiful. And so here, the the first one, or what was his name? Prathama, is the, the first kind of student called Prathama is distinguished by the intense desire to listen to the teachings which has to be kept alive until the knowledge takes place completely and without a doubt. Shushrusha shrotum icha. But increasingly the word shushrusha has come to mean seva or service to the teacher. What is the reason? Because those are two different verbs. Sevate, another verb, you know. And uh, shrinoti. Another verb. So this is two different verbs. But how did they come to be synonymous? Because the whole idea is to uh, not be not be shy or frightened of spending the time that is needed in a teaching situation, you know, or with the, in the company of the teacher to be able to learn. You know, that's how I learned. You know, I was traveling with Swamiji all the time. And I was listening to him, of course, to, listening in the classroom situation. And out of the classroom situation also, there were so many things I learned. And just by watching, because everything cannot be taught, you know, in a certain way. You watch and you learn, you learn from how the person conducts themselves in other situations. You learn from how, what they say, what they don't say, etc. And so provided the Shraddha is there, there are many opportunities to learn. And so what do I do? I put myself in a place of service so that I can benefit from these opportunities to learn. So even when I am serving, the point of the serving is not to do the teacher a favor, but I am doing myself a favor by putting myself in a, in a situation of learning. You know? So this is what is called Shushrusha. And so Anandagiri gives two criteria for the first kind of fellow, the Prathama, Uttama. The so one is this, the one who always is, uh, is interested in Shushrusha and the one who is wanting to, you know, increase the time spent in learning situations so that one can learn. And then he who keeps the Shraddha nicely fueled, keeps the Shraddha burning. That is the first criterion. And the second one, he says, is that the one, the shishya, the student, who is able to fill in the gaps, the blanks. Ah, this is where the, 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 inter, the power of grasping and the power of making connections and the dharana shakti comes. Like the shishya is not afraid to take this to the, the next level. You know, because the guru is not going to give, you know, the guru is not an instruction booklet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't immerse the, uh, what is that, toaster in water. 
don't have toast while sitting in the bathtub and um, it's plugged in and then you know so it may fall into the water all these things you know the instruction book booklet has to give why because the you know whatever the the, the companies that make it is philip black and decker and all they are afraid of litigation so to to cover themselves they will give very detailed and specific instructions if you do this this will happen if you don't do this that will not happen and if you don't do this oh oh the you are in in you know you are, you have gone from the frying pan of samsara to the fire of samsara the guru will not give like that yeah that is not the teacher's job the teacher's job is to teach you know and so the teachers you know are deliberately and delightfully vague about everything <laughs> yeah they are not you know because they are not trying to become your life coach yeah guru is not a life coach you know even though people want to be told what to do and in the beginning it seems wonderful oh somebody should just tell me what to do tell me what to do give me some you know give me some instructions and if you tell me what to do i will do it you know and the, that's the spiritual romanticism <laughs> yeah but the teachers are delightfully vague and if somebody goes to the teacher what should i do yeah you can do this maybe now if you do this yeah that you might be good and rarely they may say okay don't do this if the student is the equivalent of jumping off into a well if it is dangerous they will say i don't think this is for you they may say that you know rarely but generally speaking the 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 beauty of this teaching and the beauty of having a relationship with a teacher is so that you become fortified the student becomes fortified enough to take certain decisions yeah and the delightful and deliberate vagueness of the teacher helps in this um self confidence really this is what this is a mantra of self confidence there is no other mantra for this so it helps the self confidence and in fact if the teacher were to keep on telling one what to do then what will happen then that self confidence will never come because the teacher instead of letting you shine is becoming an eclipse is like rahu overshadowing every decision that you are making you know so it should be up to you it should be up to the student to decide how to lead their everyday life that is not the teacher's job should i eat now should i go later or should i go to the bathroom now and should i uh, you know clean up after i eat is that a good thing to do you know should i say thank you should i say please these are all we hope that you have learnt all these things at home that is why what why parents are called the first gurus <laughs> they teach you these things parents or caregivers are the first gurus they teach you when it is appropriate to go to the bathroom when it is not and when it is appropriate to talk what to say what to not say we hope that you know that the home training has been given that is not you know that is not coming under the thing but you know everybody has this secret desire to be rescued <laughs> sometimes not so secret yeah <laughs> yeah i want to be rescued and i want to i want to be lifted from all these boring mundane idiotic tasks that i have to do every day why can't just someone make my decisions for me and just give me a list today you are doing this this is what i want and as long as i am committed to that list i have something to do and i am again using that list to get out of my life because there's a whole there's a bigger list in here that needing attention yeah and that list has to you know that list is uh, uh, you know still from being procrastinated upon so you cannot use the teacher the one cannot use the teacher to you know to become distracted again from the focus on oneself and the teacher if the teacher is uh, worth their uh, you know what they have learned if they have learned properly they will not use the devotion and the reverence of the student will be returned back to them with interest they will not misuse it and 
for their own gain and say, uh, uh, even, even if the gain is not material, the gain of feeling, oh, I'm in charge, even that gain, like an ego trip, they will not use it. So the second one, we, we are still in the uh, middle of it, um, but it is break time. So the second one, what I'm starting to, you know, unfold on what Anandagiri said here, uh, this, the first criteria is Shushrusha of the exalted one. The second one would be the, the, the confidence, the ability to grasp what is said and to go, to be in line with the mind of the teacher, to be in alignment with the mind of the teacher. And uh, even though that sounds a little scary and startling, um, that's just for before the break. I'm just sort of, uh, you know, I'm just compiling it in a few words. But when I come back, we will unfold this a little further. Okay? Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamadachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihi Om I think it's ha ha indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like ha he ha ha he oh ha. Uh, it's all run together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she just wrote yes. I think we get it right. Ha ha, ha indeed. indeed. Yes. I need to take one quill and do that. <laughs> <laughs> 